Welcome to episode 12 of the Connectome podcast. Today's show is about a brand new technology that enables computers to have active dialogues with specific groups of brain cells. In other words, this system doesn't just stimulate a group of brain cells so we can watch what happens. No, no, no. This system targets specific brain cells, triggers them to fire, watches what they do in response, and then changes its targets on the fly and fires again and again and again to hold an active ongoing dialogue with groups of brain cells in the brains of living awake animals. My guest today is Michael Hauser, one of the lead designers of this system. Michael is a neuroscientist at the Wolfson Institute for Biomedical Research at University College London, and I'm excited to talk with him today about how this new system may transform the ways we study some of neuroscience's most important questions. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks. My first question is about this word hologram that you use in your paper. You talk about this as a system that holographically controls the activity of brain cells. What exactly does it mean to holographically control brain cells? Well, basically it means splitting up a light beam into multiple beamlets and targeting them to individual cells that you pre-select. Okay, so to produce the hologram, we have a device called a spatial light modulator, which basically can split up the light into beamlets that we can control very precisely and target to exactly the cells that we want. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about this special device you use to target your lasers at individual neurons. In the paper, you call it a spatial light modulator. How does that work? This gives us a much more precise way of optogenetically activating cells than the conventional way, which is to basically use wide field delivery of the light, where you basically put the optogenetic light, like blue light, for example, through the objective, and all of the cells in the field of view will then receive the blue, blue light illumination. And what the SLM does is it allows us to actually define exactly where the light's gonna go and only switch on the cells that we want. And the cool thing about this paper is that we're combining this with an approach for also recording activity from the same cells in the circuit. So what we can do is we can do a dream experiment in neuroscience, which is to actually only switch on the cells that have a particular pattern of activity. Right. For example, the cells that are doing a particular job, right, like responding to a specific stimulus. So before, all we could do with optogenetics is to activate cells of a particular genetic type, right? So, for example, a certain class of interneurons or a certain class of, of principal cells, pyramidal cells, and essentially you were, you were activating all of them in the circuit. But, you know, the brain doesn't work with all of the neurons active at the same time, the reason the brain is so powerful is that very selective sets of neurons are active at at a given point in time to process, for example, a, a certain stimulus or to carry out a certain task. And so to figure out how the brain works, we need to be able to activate those cells really selectively. And this is what this technique enables us to do. It enables us, first of all, to look at which cells are active using the imaging component of the approach, and then to use the holography to basically target the light to those particular cells. And is your technique the first to be able to target particular cells in this way? What exactly is new about what your team has accomplished here? Well, the uh, spatial light modulators, uh, this is a technology that's been around for a few years, but it's only been applied to neuroscience over the past couple of years. It was pioneered, for example, by the lab of Rafael Yusti at Columbia University. And he had a few early papers in 2008, for example, uh, that we cited in the proof that I sent you. But nobody's yet applied the SLM for use in vivo and in the intact brain. So so the Yusti group used it in in brain slices, so in, in small sections of the brain cut from the living brain and maintained alive in a dish 
But of course, you know, for the really dream experiments that neuroscience want to do, we have to be able to do them in the awake behaving animal, right, in the intact brain, when the brain is actually doing its normal jobs. And so this is the first time that this approach has actually been applied in the awake behaving brain. That's what's exciting about it. Oh, so you guys can actually choose which neurons to trigger and change your selection of neurons on the fly in the brains of living animals. Yeah, I'd say that's a big step forward. Now, I know some other researchers have used lasers to set off chain reactions in groups of neurons, but you guys, on the other hand, target every single neuron you want to trigger and you set them all off at the same time. What's the reasoning behind doing it that way? Because the way the brain works involves engaging a particular subset of neurons that are doing a specific task, that are responsible for a specific task. And it's unclear how many neurons and what fraction of neurons uh, we need to perform specific tasks. That, that's one of the, the big open questions in neuroscience. And to be able to get at that question, we need to be able to really select cells which are engaged during a particular type of processing. Right? So basically, the idea is that, which has been around for about 50 years or so, from the original work of Donald Hebb, is that in neural circuits, when they're performing certain tasks, neurons are activated in ensembles, right? Subpopulations, where these subpopulations are either representing information or carrying out a certain kind of processing to perform a particular task. So to be able to, to get at what is the neural code during this processing, we need to be able to only activate the precise set of neurons which are engaged during that task. And this new approach basically allows us to finally do that in the intact brain while the animal is engaged in behavior. Right, yeah, and having this kind of interaction with neurons in living brains will give us a lot more insight, I think, into how they behave during normal daily life. Now, you already mentioned how this technique has some advantages over selecting neurons genetically, because this technique lets you select your neurons functionally based on what they're doing, how they're involved in specific tasks. Uh, what's the advantage of targeting specific neurons like this instead of choosing them by their characteristics beforehand, the way that some of those older studies did? Well, that we can very quickly switch between different populations, that we can, you know, different neurons different sets of neurons may be engaged in different elements of a task, and we can jump in between those different ensembles extremely quickly using this approach and look at how different populations work together. Another thing we can do is we can also use this approach for connectomics, and in particular for functional connectomics. So there's been a lot of excitement about new technologies for connectomics, right, for getting at the connectome of the cortex. And those are essentially purely anatomical approaches for looking at who is connected to who. If we want to figure out the, how the brain works, we need to all, not only know what is that roadmap, but we also need to know the effect of one cell on another and the effect of one population on another population. Yeah. Because it combines stimulation and readout from the same population, we can also do so-called functional connectomics where we can stimulate one group of cells and look at its effect on another group of cells and thereby really figure out how information is routed through the circuit, how that process is engaged during a behaviorally relevant computation, and then link it to the underlying connectome, right? Link it to the anatomical information about who's connected to who. Right. So basically, you need all these three things. You need not only the anatomical connectome, who's connected to who, you need the functional connectome, how these groups actually talk to each other, who's lighting up who, and then you need to use that information to understand what computation is being performed in that circuit. Yeah, so we actually need all three types of models, the anatomical, functional, and the computational, to understand how the brain works, right? And how do the mechanics of your technique help you get at those other kinds of information, the functional and computational kinds of data that you're talking about. Okay, so the core of the, the approach is expressing two proteins in the cells at the same time. It involves expressing, first of all, an activity sensor, 
and we use a, a genetically encoded calcium sensor called GCAMP6, which was developed at Janelia Farm by Lauren Luger's group. And this allows us to read out the activity of neurons in the circuit with single cell precision and also with single spike precision. And next, in the same cells, we also express an optogenetic probe. This is a variant of channel rhodopsin called C1V1. And this has the advantage that we can use two photon excitation to activate the cells expressing this protein. So with these two probes expressed in the same cells, we can use two photon excitation to both read out the activity using our activity sensor and also manipulate the activity using the optogenetic probe, using the C1V1 probe. And so that's really great because then we have single cell, single spike control of the activity and also readout of the activity from the same cells. So you guys have basically set up uh, a basic input-output system for specific groups of neurons, almost like the BIOS that we have in our computers. That's very cool. That's really cool. So in terms of the experiment itself, what did you guys actually do and what did you find out? Well, what we did, first of all, is we showed that we could achieve very precise stimulation of the cells that we were imaging. So in figure one, we could show that we could activate very precisely and reliably single action potentials in cells that we're targeting. Next, we showed that we could do this reliably in small ensembles of cells, so small groups of cells activating simultaneously. Next, we showed that we can do this while we're reading out activity in the entire network. So we can listen to the network and see how it's responding to precise stimulation of, of a set of cells. Then what we did is we showed how the response of the cells can change during different behavioral states, either when the animal is resting and when the animal is running. And we show that the activity of the cells is enhanced when the animals are running. Finally, we show that we can actually pick out and activate specific sets of cells that are responding to a very precise stimulus. So most of our experiments were done in, in the so-called barrel cortex of the mouse, which is getting input from the whiskers. And we showed that we could activate specifically the sets of cells which are responding to a particular kind of whisker stimulation. What this puts us in the position to do is to look at how activity patterns in precise sets of cells can give rise to sensory perception of a particular stimulus. So you guys were really closing in on the neural coding for sensory information. Uh, that really makes me wonder, when you activated those sensory patterns in the mice's brains, did they respond as though their whiskers were actually touching something? <laughs> well, well those, are, those are experiments we're working on right now. Basically, what this puts us in the position to do is to look at the neural code for sensation. Because what we can do is we can now activate specific subsets of cells in this sensory cortex, and we can see how many cells are needed for the animal to perceive a particular stimulus. Right? We can basically get the animal to respond as if it's been detecting the actual sensory stimulus. We can have like a, if you like, a, a phantom stimulus, which we play into the cortex, and see when the animal is gonna respond best and say, hey, I've detected a whisker stimulation when all we've done is essentially activated a pattern in its whisker cortex. And we also can play games like look at the spatial pattern of the cells that we need to activate. We can look at the, the temporal pattern of activity in those neurons. We can really get at fundamental questions about the neural code that's responsible for sensation. And of course, we can do this now in other parts of cortex, doing more high-level kind of processing. For example, th there was the Nobel Prize this year for the neurons that are representing spatial information in the brain to John O'Keefe and the Mosers. And one approach could be to now go into those parts of cortex and play in patterns and see if we can help the animal to navigate in the environment by essentially feeding in information into the cortex. So, you know, this is a methods paper, it's a technical paper. 
which kind of lays the foundation for some really exciting experiments that are going to explore the neural code for all sorts of different kinds of computations in the brain. So we may not be too far away from understanding how the brain's coding represents certain types of information. That could help us get a better grip on the question of how many neurons you really need in order to represent a given concept and how many of them you have to lose before you lose that concept. Absolutely, exactly. Is, is, is one cell enough to, to represent uh, uh, information that's behaviorally relevant? And, and what pattern, pattern of activity in that cell is sufficient to represent the information? Right. So maybe there's also another angle to take, which is that for the past couple of hundred years, neurophysiologists have been relying on trusty stimulation electrode and recording electrode to record and manipulate activity in the brain, right? This is starting with Luigi Galvani back in, in uh, the 1700s, you know, who showed, had this famous experiment showing that he could, with an electrical stimulus, make a frog's leg uh, twitch, right? And since then, people have been using metal electrodes to record and stimulate from the brain. That, that's been the, the basic approach for how we understand the brain. And this approach where you're combining readout and stimulation with light heralds kind of a, a new era where we'll be able to do without the metal electrodes that we've been using for, for 200 years to study the brain. You know, there's huge advantages to using light to study the brain because it's not invasive, it's fast, it's, it can be targeted. Uh, you can have also long-term interrogation of the brain with light. So it, it's really going to be an exciting era, kind of going beyond the, the recording electrode that's made possible now with this kind of approach. Yeah, an era in which our computers can directly dialogue with specific groups of brain cells in the brains of awake living animals. That is both deeply bizarre and, to me, really, really exciting. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for being on the show today. Thanks. Yeah, it was really great to have you. Thank you so much. And for those of you listening, you can easily track down Michael Houser and his research on the web. Just Google his name or Google Wolfson Institute for Biomedical Research. You can find the lab and all of the projects that they're working on. If you'd like to learn more about the field of optogenetics, just visit the Connectome homepage and click the optogenetics tag in our tag cloud on the right sidebar. You can see all of our articles about this really cool field, which is developing really quickly. And uh, hopefully those will give you some jumping off points for your own investigations. As far as podcasts, we have lots more cool stuff coming soon. We have researchers who I think you're gonna be really interested to hear from. And until then, have a great week, everybody. Go do some science!